worship team. It's a pleasure to have you here to worship with us today on this soggy, soggy day, but we're glad you came out to uh, worship together, to study God's Word, and we hope that you find encouragement in Him. Uh, We continue our series entitled Knowing I Am. Today we're in John chapter 11 is where we're going to be for our statement. Just to remind you, there's still books up here on the front if you haven't grabbed one of these gentle and lowly uh, as we continue to study and understand the character of Christ and how that idea of who he is and how we view him is so radical to everything that we do in life. And the scriptures have been clear to give different ideas of who he is and what his character is really like. And our prayer is that we will continue together to learn and to grow uh, as we seek to know him. Now, this morning, we're going to talk about something that the world is fascinated with. And that fascination comes with near-death experiences. You know, we have all kinds of books that have been written by individuals that have come right to the edge of death and then have come back to share what they experienced. One popular book was entitled Heaven is for Real. It was put out in 2010. It's on the New York bestsellers list. It was a story of a young boy, three or four years old, that went in for an appendectomy and later told his parents that he experienced an out-of-body experience and went to heaven. And the whole book is in, deals with that. In one year, there were over a million, a million copies sold. In the next four years, there were over 10 million copies sold, which also landed a nice movie deal, which grossed over $100 million, all on this account of a child's experience. For individuals trying to figure out what happens after I die. What happens at that moment? What am I to expect? Which is fascinating because the fact that the one man that knew what heaven was like in all of his fullness came in the form of mankind and didn't give us any more detail than we have in the scriptures. Jesus, who could have answered every question you could possibly think of what would happen at the moment of death, He gave us enough information for us, but not always enough to satisfy our appetites. So today we're going to be talking about this dimension of the resurrection. What happens after death? So if you have your Bible in John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26 say this. Jesus said to her, he was talking directly to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, most of the time, death is not the subject that you bring up, that you just love to talk about, that you love to spend all of your time dwelling on and thinking about. So what do we do with that when Jesus is dealing with an issue of death? Well, we do recognize death is inevitable. Ben Franklin, one of his last greatest quotes, is something that maybe you have said before. He was writing to a friend, uh, and they were bringing an update on what was going on in America, and he is talking about uh, the Constitution. And he says, our Constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. He concluded to tell his friend that the reality is I'm nearing the end of my life. He was becoming weaker and weaker and weaker at this stage, recognizing that death was coming for him as well. So we quote it, but we don't always think about where did that come from? This week we experienced the death anniversary of my sister. You see, death changes individuals. My sister was 10 years old when she passed away to cancer. I was in first grade, and yet that had a profound impact on my life on my parents' life, friends and family, uh, classmates that she had as she attended a blind school. Um, Death has an impact. We just don't always like to talk about it. In fact, most of what we do in our culture is how do we put death off as far as absolutely possible? And yet, how do we respond to that as Christians? What does the world look and see in our life versus what they are living by and how long they are trying to 
extend their life here for as long as possible because the reality is they have no certainty of what will come after death. So what do we do with that? That's a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today as we get into Jesus and Lazarus. So let's pray and we'll begin our study this morning. Father, we thank you that today we have the Holy Spirit living within us for those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That the same power that rose Christ from the grave is now living and abiding within us is something that's very hard for us to wrap our minds around. Father, our prayer is that as we study your word today, that your Holy Spirit will have freedom to lead and guide us into all truth and that you will help us to understand and to know you better as a result of digging into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, when we think about this idea and this picture of death, uh, you know, the there's a reality that this was not God's original intent. You see, when he created everything on this earth and he created man and woman and he put them in the Garden of Eden to tend it. And there was this hope that they would be able to live in perfection there. Genesis chapter 3 tells us, this is after the fall now, but I want you to see the insight of of what God did in the garden. Genesis 3, says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out, from, uh, so he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east of the gar- garden of Eden. And a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You see, this is dealing with after the fall and the consequences of the fall. But the reason that God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden was not just a consequence, but it was honestly an act of grace. Because had they, in that fallen state, continued to eat of the tree of life and live forever, there was no rescue plan. They would forever live and be in that eternal state. But in order for God to allow a time of redemption, death was brought into the picture with the fall. We know that at at the moment of sin, there was separation. There was a change in their relationship with God immediately. But also then they physically began to die in a way that they had not experienced before. But because of that, that reality and that condition now that they were in, in the fallen state, God says, the very best thing for me to do is to make sure that they do not eat of a tree of life and live forever in that state. You see, they had freedom before this. They had freedom to eat of this tree. So God didn't start this process by saying, I really want death to be in the picture. No, he wanted life. And that's what he breathed into man. And in Genesis 3, he also gives a promise here as he's talking about the fall and particularly the consequences to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That at this moment in the fall and dealing with the consequences of the fall of mankind, God still gave hope. And said, even though it looks bleak right now, and even though the serpent can continue to nip at the heel of man, I will send someone that will crush the serpent, that will bruise his head. You see, this was a promise that the Jews knew all the way back to Genesis. That the way things were when Jesus came on the scene and death and life and this pattern that had continued for generations was not God's original intent. But what do we do with it? Because we live in a world where death is here. And we recognize the grief and the heartache and the hurt when somebody we love or somebody that we care about dies. So today we're going to look at John chapter 11 and we're going to try to understand and see, okay, what did Jesus focus on? Where was his attention? And in the midst of this miracle and this declaration that I am the resurrection and the life, where were the religious leaders' focus? 
And we're going to kind of compare those two ideas and then come together at the end as we focus on this miracle that Jesus did. So as we go back to John chapter 11, we set the scene for this story. That Jesus, remember when we left in John chapter 10, he had healed a blind man. They, the religious leaders had kicked that blind man out of the synagogue. So Jesus withdrew over to the Jordan where John the Baptist was baptizing. And he took his disciples out there away from everyone. And he's over there and there are people that were coming and, and some were putting their faith in him, but he was out in the wilderness. As he was there, John chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sister sent to Jesus him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, they had had interactions with Jesus. Jesus had been in their home, and now their brother was sick. But recognize how they present this. Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, remember if you studied the book of John, remember how he refers to himself as the one who Jesus loved? That connection is so deep and fresh in John's mind. But it was also that it wasn't unique just to John. That when individuals had relationships with Jesus Christ, they felt and knew his love. So this was somebody that was special to Jesus. At least the sisters acknowledged, look, Lazarus, the one whom you love, he is sick. So in the midst of this setting in this story, when Jesus gets this message, recognize that there is a focal point of love that's going to come throughout this whole, this whole story. That when Jesus senses the need, he focuses on what does love look like here? And if you go down to verse 5 and 6, this may not look like love. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So John continues to bring that to the forefront throughout this whole story. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Now, okay. When you think about love, somebody reaches out to you and says, I, we are in dire dire straits here. Think, okay, I really love you. I'm just going to stay back for a few days. I'm not going to call you for a few hours, and we'll just see what happens. But there was intent to all of this. This is in no way demonstrates that Jesus really didn't love them because they knew they were loved. That was already a pre-existing condition to their whole relationship. I know that Jesus loves us. And John makes sure everybody knows it wasn't just Lazarus, but he also loved his sisters as well. But why? Why stay two more days? Because as we look at this story and we think of the focus that Jesus had, it was love for the individuals, but there was another purpose as well, that the Father would be glorified in this whole situation. That when we come to a crisis, when we come to a very difficult situation, where is our focus? That's oftentimes, get me out of it as quickly as possible. And that would be a normal response. Send word to Jesus, my brother is sick, we're very concerned for him, we know that he can do something about this, And Jesus says, I I do love you. He he does recognize that. But there was something also going on here that the Father would be glorified. Look in verse 4. Now when Jesus heard that, that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness is not unto death, what? But for the glory of God. That the Son of God may be glorified through it. Yes, he waited there for two more days, But he wants the disciples to know there is something that is greater that's going on in this situation. Now, the disciples had no idea what Jesus had in mind. Remember, we have to be careful not to, since we already know the end of the story, to read that into the middle of it. But the disciples are trying to figure this out. And Jesus is saying, okay, he's sick, uh, but not unto death. 
but something that's going on in this situation, God the Father is going to be revealed. And not only is the glory of God going to be revealed, but the Son, Jesus Christ, will also be glorified in the midst of this. There is something that's going to go on in this situation that Christ will be glorified and shown off in all of his glory, in his true identity. That's why we continue to study these I am statements, because we're trying to figure out what is the identity of Christ? What is the identity of God the Father? So there was a purpose there. So let's see how this situation plays out in verse 18 of John chapter 11. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Remember, Jesus was with his disciples on the other side of the Jordan. So it was a bit of a journey to get to Bethany. But now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary. So what we do know about this family is that they were, they were well known. They were well cared for, not just by Christ, but even the Jewish community, so that those that were in Jerusalem were coming out to comfort and to be with Mary and Martha in their very desperate situation, to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. So she got word. Jesus is close by. And she takes off out of the house to go and to meet Jesus, to have this conversation just with him. Now we know from John chapter 11, one of the first things she says is, Jesus, I know if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. I've seen it. I know that you've had the power to heal. I know that you love my brother. I know if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have taken care of that. You could have healed him on the spot. I know that. This is where Jesus makes the statement to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Because he asked her, do you believe this? She says, I know that my brother will one day in the last day rise from the grave. He's trying to talk to Martha, and he says, Martha, you're going to experience something very dramatic right now. But what is interesting to me, that as we talk about Jesus' focus, and we look not only at his character, but how did he go about this? Knowing what was going to happen, Jesus knew what he was going to do. But he doesn't bust into the house saying, I'm arrived, everything's okay. He doesn't come into the house to make an incredible theological discussion about the resurrection and life after death to everyone that's there in the room. Say, remember, I've been there. I've already been up to heaven. I can tell you what this is all all about. He doesn't come in as the one with all the answers. He comes in with a concern for individual and he focuses on the individual's. Before he even comes into whole, the whole gathering, he's meeting with Martha individually, checking on her, finding out how she's doing. She's free to express to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. So Martha then goes and she brings Mary. Says, the teacher, he's here. Again, Jesus stays out of the house. He stays in the background, but he's concerned for Mary as well. And Mary rushes out to be with Jesus. And she says the exact same thing. If you had been here, my brother would not be dead. You see, these ladies had put their faith that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They knew it. They had seen that he had power over all kinds of diseases and the demonic. They saw it and they knew if you would have been here, the story would have ended differently. So Jesus tell, asked Mary, take me to where they've laid him. They go to the tomb, and his first request is, go ahead and roll the stone away. To which Martha says, look, this is not a good idea. Look, he's been in there for four days. This is not going to be pleasant for anyone that is around here. And yet at his command, they roll the stone away. But even as he is getting ready to do this, Jesus could have stepped on the scene to say, see, no more crying. 
There is nothing you have to worry about today. But instead, in verse 35, we read one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Now, if you grew up in the church or you ever had like a, you know, a memorization challenge, this is probably one of the verses, if you got to choose a verse, you are going to verse, chapter 11, verse 35, which simply says, Jesus wept. You see, when his focus was on the individuals, he was free to enter into their pain. He knew what the outcome was going to be when he had the stone rolled away. He knew it. But his focus wasn't just on his solution to the problem and his taking care of everyone. He was able to enter into their pain. And so what we see that his focus on in the midst of all of this is still this dimension of compassion for where individuals are. When we think about death or somebody experiences death, I I recognize sometimes it's really hard. It's really hard to know what do you even say to this individual that's hurting. Now, as as you're going through this, if you've lost somebody, I can tell you probably one of the things not to say. Okay, if somebody has experienced the death of a loved one, one of the things that will not be comforting them to say, you know what, I lost my cat a couple of weeks ago. I understand exactly what you are going through. <laughs> but we recognize that sometimes in the moment you panic. But that's one of the things probably to stay away from. Don't try to empathize in that way. But notice what Jesus did. He entered into their pain and he was emotional in the same way that they were emotional. He was free to be compassionate to them with exactly where they were. And he saw the hurt. He saw the grief. And he was there with them. But it's fascinating to think, the God of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. But we see his focus is on compassion. It's always on the individual, not just on what he is going to do to solve the problem. So oftentimes when people are experiencing sadness and grief over death, one of the things that you can do is just be there. Just take the weight off your shoulders to say, what am I going to do to comfort them? And what am I going to say that's going to bring relief? Probably very little. Because every situation is so different. And people respond so differently to death. But to know that they're not alone, that they're cared for, that people are hurting because they are hurting, there is a depth of comfort in that, that you are not alone in this. When the individual saw that Jesus wept, the Jews, their response was, see, we knew he loved him. But Jesus didn't say anything. He didn't have to try to convince everybody how much he loved them. He was able to enter into their pain and was compassionate to others. So that we know, after that in John 11, 35, that Jesus calls out. We're going to look at that prayer in just a little while, but he calls out to the Father and Lazarus rises from the grave. It's really hard for us to wrap our mind around. Yeah, it's very out there. I've never seen anything like that. Good chance you've never seen anything like that. It's hard to wrap our mind around all that would be going through the sisters' minds as well as Lazarus. Maybe he didn't want to come back. We don't know. The Bible doesn't really give any account or testimony of what Lazarus experienced. I mean, if you want to find a book deal, you would have thought Lazarus could have had it. We don't have any account of that. But notice 
Jesus' focus, and notice then the religious leaders' focus. What were they focused on when they heard that Lazarus had risen from the grave and it was Jesus Christ that had done it? In verse 47 and 48 of John chapter 11, it says this, because when that happened, some of the Jews believed in Jesus right then, John tells us. Others went to tell the Pharisees. You guys better know what happened. So when the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. What are we going to do? Notice their focus. First of all, the religious leaders were focused on how do we keep our flock? We don't want anyone else following Jesus Christ as the Messiah. What are we going to do? How do we keep our flock together? We don't want anyone else believing in Jesus Christ. So what are we going to do? The focus was on their flock, not the flock that they were committed to shepherding. Remember the Jewish leaders, they were God's representation. And yet they're focused on how do we control this? Verse 48 also tells us that not only were they focused on keeping their flock but they were focused on how do we keep our place in society. Remember, Israel was a conquered nation. So what Rome allowed them to do was very pivotal to them. So they're trying to wrestle through this. If Jesus really is the Messiah, and he's going to be ushering in this kingdom, man, if if people start believing this stuff, we may lose our place with Rome. And that could have been the synagogue where they actually met to worship, which was destroyed in 66 AD. Or it could have also been their position with Rome. Because in order to be serving under Rome and to have authority under Rome, they had to have a political connection. So the religious leaders are trying to figure out, what do we do here? And lastly, their focus is, what about our nation? We can't let the Jewish people disperse on our watch. So how are we going to control this? How do we keep everybody from believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah? How do we make sure we retain the authority that we currently have in society? How do we make sure we don't lose ourselves as a nation? Do you see that similarity that keeps the thread that runs through all of that? Is it the people or is it themselves? Just like last week with the blind man, remember, they couldn't rejoice, but instead they had to kick him out of the synagogue. We have the same idea here. Instead of being able to rejoice that somebody has been brought back from the dead, all they are focused on is how do we keep control of this? You see, the reality of where the religious leaders already were, they had tried to stone him and to seize him all the way back at the end of chapter 10. So when Jesus takes the disciples and goes off into the wilderness, it's to give them some space from the religious leaders. So that when Jesus says, fellas, we're headed to Bethany. Do you remember in chapter 11, the disciples' response? Jesus, do you remember they just tried to kill you? Why would we go that direction? The wilderness is safe and comfortable. Maybe Lazarus will just get better on his own. Finally, he has to tell him, no, Lazarus is dead. We are going to Bethany. And Thomas, who we often just label as the doubter, right, after the resurrection, unless I see the nail prints in his hand, unless I see the scars, I won't believe. We see a different different side of Thomas when he says, well, let's go up to Jerusalem and die with Jesus. The disciples, when they were leaving that sanctuary in the wilderness, understood there's a high probability we're going to be stoned. 
So let's go to Bethany with Jesus. But if Jesus was focused on himself, he would have stayed in the wilderness. Guys, we're safe here. Nobody's coming out to pick on us out here. But instead, out of love for others and his compassion for those that were weeping, he entered into their pain, even though it took him into a place of danger. And when Lazarus rose from the grave, it just intensified because their great answer to all of this and how do we keep the flock is the prophecy that Jesus needs to die for the sins of the world. The high priest makes a prophecy that it's better for one guy to die than the whole nation be conquered from Rome. See, the religious leaders were trying to preserve what they had at all costs because their focus was inward. Rather than Jesus releasing all of that and being able to freely enter into someone else's life, even at his own risk. How easily we can fall into this same trap. Whether that's in our job, how do I keep the authority in the position that I have? Whether that's in the family, how do I get what I want in life, or in my family, or with my kids, or try to hold on to it at all costs? Rather than say, how do I love? How do I enter into what they're going through, what their pain is, what they are experiencing? Remember, Jesus' focus was that the Father would be glorified. So then in John chapter 11, verse 40, Jesus says to Martha, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he makes the declaration for Lazarus, come forth. He was focused on the individuals and he was focused on revealing the glory of God. So he did this in his prayer that they would believe that you sent me. I recognize the power that you have and I want everybody around me to know where this power comes from. I want them to know that you sent me. So the last thing Jesus revealed was his authority and power over death. And in the midst of what we experience, the the grief and the hurt that we go through when we experience loss, this is a comfort. God alone has the power over death, and Jesus revealed that while he was here on earth. He conquered death in the grave, And now you and I have the opportunity to experience abundant life in the way that we never could beforehand. That that same resurrection power that we just sung about a little bit ago is now living within me through the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't minimize when we lose someone we love, there is sadness. Because you've lost someone close. Maybe you have been really close with that individual for a really, really long time. So it's not to minimize that if, you know, if you grieve for the loss of somebody that has died, that you've done something wrong. But what Jesus continues to affirm is don't forget, there is more to this life. Death is not final. There may be a period of separation, but it's not final. Because the one who has power over death and was able to raise the dead to life as the testimony and counsel we have in the Gospels, that's the same Savior that we put our faith and trust in for salvation. Because it's unfortunate that in the midst of some that saw this miracle, there were still two responses. 
Some, when they saw the miracle, believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Others saw the miracle and ran to tell the Pharisees. Now we can have this tendency in our lives <clears throat> that says, Lord, if only, if only I could see some kind of a miracle, if only you would do something miraculous in my life, then I would believe. <clears throat> but I want you to know from Scripture that's not a guarantee. You see, there were many people that followed Jesus just to see what he was going to do next, to see what miracle he would do for other people or for themselves. <clears throat> but as we go through this whole series, it's this idea that it's not just what Jesus did, but it's who he declared himself to be. And that he wants to have a relationship with you and I today. The one that says, I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to experience it abundantly and fully as I always intended it to be. Both here now on earth and in the age to come, that this is not the end. But is that true of you? Why do you follow? What are you looking for? Christ wants him, you to know him personally. And he wants you to know his Father, who he came to glorify and to show off in all of his fullness. We will experience grief and sadness here, right? Two things are inevitable, death and taxes. <clears throat> Can't get around that. But it doesn't have to determine your joy or sorrow in your life. You don't have to be ruled by it because God is doing something greater here and he wants you to experience his fullness. He is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the life of Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him so that we could see and understand and know who you are as revealed in the scriptures. Father, we recognize that in this world we're going to have loss and we're going to have sadness and grief when people that we love die. But Father, I'm so grateful that that is not the rest, that's not the only part of the story. <clears throat> that because you have conquered death, Father, we can experience life both here and forever with you. Father, I pray that you will help us as we grow in our relationship with you and we continue to know and to pursue you. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for coming and worshiping with us.